Cool. So, um, so we started our, our discussion of, of global climate change the other day, and it's interesting. I teach a senior seminar course in environmental studies as well, and um, just before this class, and one of the the talks was one of the presentations one of the students gave was on the topic of like like climate change and like why it's so contentious, right? Like why there are people that um, that you know, that kind of object to the science behind it, you know, like that whole dynamic. And, um, and it, was, it was kind of interesting because every now and then, like, scientific issues get politicized, right? And that when people look at whether, you know, when they ask the question of what's going on, it's not as simple for some folks as saying, well, what do the data tell us, right? It's like, well, what do the data tell us? Oh, but, like, what are the scientists, like, trying to do, like, what, like, what are, what's their agenda? Like, what about this other data that shows this? Um, and I think one of those issues, like, initially was, was evolution. Like, for a while, there was a lot of objection to the idea of, of evolution. And, um, you know, folks saying things like, well, like, we couldn't have evolved from monkeys. And, um, and, you know, in reality, like, that's not what evolution says. Like, we defined it, right? It's like a genetic change in population. Like, it's something we can measure and be like, be like, yeah, like genes have changed, right? So things, things have changed. And I think by defining evolution like carefully and like actually looking at data, like we can get to the point of like, well, when we define it this way, then like, like yeah, like this is happening. Um, and climate change in some ways is, is similar. I think, you know, the challenge about climate change is that there are implications about our own lifestyles, right? And that, like, if we accept that carbon emissions are changing the climate of our planet, then the next obvious question is, if we don't want to change the climate of our planet, then, then we need to become less reliant on fossil fuels, right? And, and of course, do you remember our stat from the other day about what percentage of US energy comes from renewable sources? Yeah, 10 to 15 percent, like, like 11 or 12 percent. Like, so we get a very small proportion of our energy from renewable sources. And so if, in fact, carbon emissions are affecting our planet's climate, then there are implications about, like, if we want things to kind of stay the way that they've been, then, like, we've got to put less carbon into the atmosphere. And, and that's challenging, right, of course, because we have economies that have functioned the way that they've functioned for you know, 200 years anyway. Um, and so, you know, change is not comfortable for folks. And so it's, it's, more, it's easier to kind of question the data and the conclusions than to question like our own, like our own lifestyle, right? Like it's, it's less comfortable to be like, well, you know, is what I'm doing right, you know? Um, and again, my whole thing with college is like, we're not trying to tell you what to think, we're just, trying to learn how to think, right? And whatever you decide after looking at data and, and thinking as a scientist, then that's great, right? Because scientists aren't attached to our hypotheses, right? A hypothesis is just our best explanation for what we see in the world. And when something better comes along, if you're a good scientist, then you should be willing to kick that hypothesis to the curb when it doesn't account for the data anymore. Um, but anthropogenic climate change, um, just like evolution, is just the scientist's best theory that explains the data that we've come across so far. So, um, so anyway, just be careful with scientific issues about forming opinions that aren't based on data. You know, Be careful about forming opinions on scientific issues that are just based on the opinions of our friends. Because they might be people that we care about a lot, but ultimately, if we don't go back to the data, we're going to get burned. We're going to get burned if we do things in a way that's contrary to, um, to what science is, is telling us, right? Um, so, so anyway, uh, we had our articles that I hope you took a look at for today, and I'd like to chat about them just at that little bit at the end of class today. Um, but I, so I found an interesting study the other day, which I thought I'd share. Um, and 
you know, we talked about how air pollution, you know, still affects our health, even though it's not as bad as it used to be. It's an interesting study linking uh, COVID uh, deaths to air pollution intake and found that um, in Southeast Asia, 27% of COVID deaths and 90% of deaths in Europe, and in 17% in North America, 17% of COVID deaths could be attributed to the health effects of air pollution. So if someone is living in an area that they're exposed um, to unhealthy air, uh, then they're more likely to get a real bad case um, of COVID and um, you know, something that might potentially even lead, lead to death. So um, I think it just shows that you know, air pollution is something we've uh, been working on and getting better at in our country, but it's still something that um, that has negative health effects that we have to be thinking of. <clears throat> All right, and last time we looked at a graphic here about changes in temperature uh, and you know, just kind of making the point that there, there's a clear trend in warming, right? That these, this is um, global surface temperature. This is 1880. And so this black horizontal line is the 20th century average uh, and so the blue bars are years that had temperatures below that average. The red bars are years that had temperatures above that average. Um, and again, it doesn't take uh, a, a PhD to look at these and say, yeah, there were a lot more blue bars, and particularly like big ones, uh, earlier in this time sequence. And recently, um, things have been getting warmer. And uh, 20, you know, 2014, 2015, 2016 were consecutively the warmest years on record since uh, 1880. So, you know, this is data, right? This is data. And then we looked at atmospheric CO2 concentrations uh, that they've been going up. Uh, we talked about how CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas. Do you all remember what the other two main greenhouse gases were besides CO2? Methane. Yeah, good. Methane was one. And nitrous oxide was the other one. Yeah, and so they're actually more powerful greenhouse gases than CO2, but why aren't we as concerned about them? Yeah, it's a lot less of it in the atmosphere. So because of that, there's been a pretty tight correlation between CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere and global, global temp. But yeah, nitrogen, uh, nitrogen oxide and then methane are also greenhouse gases. We talked about the fact that our oceans have been absorbing a lot of that CO2, about a quarter of it. Um, and so what that's been doing then is increasing CO2 levels in the ocean as well which is problematic because it's harder uh, for, for, for things like corals and marine shellfish to create their, um, their shells because of some ion balances in the water. And um, this is an interesting little graphic that National Geographic put together. They're like, it's like my favorite magazine, if you haven't been able to tell by now. Um, and it includes that visual that I had earlier of, um, of the temperature changes. If it will pull up. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Uh huh. It's interesting. I was able to connect to this on my laptop. All right. Well, I'll just have to I'll have to pull up those graphics, I guess. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. Well, anyway, it's just making kind of this 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 visual picture with temperature, which we kind of had gotten to already. So, like, the question is, like, to what extent is human activity causing climate change, right? So the, the international, uh, sorry, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, concluded that it's over 90% likely that the most recent global warming is due to human activities. Um, you know, we can't explain uh, the global changes in temperature since the 1950s without taking into account greenhouse gas emissions. 
So, like, are we, is it completely 100%, um, you know, confirmed that humans are causing global warming? Well, it's, it's the weather, right? So we're never completely 100% sure about anything. There's so many things that, that affect it. But based on data uh, since the middle of the 20th century, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change concerned concluded that it's over 90% likely that most of this warming is due to human activity. Uh, and so there have been all sorts of, 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 um, of events like this. So countries getting together, um, urging uh, political action. But, you know, this is still kind of where we are, especially in the U.S., right, is that um, this question of climate change is still kind of stuck in, uh, in, in, uh, in a political debate in a lot of ways in the U.S. I will say that in other countries, uh, it's really not so much, but it's, that's largely been the case in the United States. So if we do acknowledge the fact that the climate is changing and that human activities are connected with it, then we have to think about what strategies to take moving forward. And so we can talk about a mitigation or an adaptation strategy. What, what might be the differences in those? Uh, close, yeah, close. So if you're trying to mitigate for something, like what are you doing? Like if you say like they're mitigating factors, like what does that mean? Any thoughts? You're making up for it. Making up for it, yeah, kind of like compensating for it, making up for it. Yeah, so, so when we talk about climate mitigation, it's, yeah, you're trying to like correct for it. You're trying to like, like, lessen its effects, right? So climate change mitigation is this idea that there are things we can do now that will lessen the severity of climate change in the future. And I'm going to mention what uh, some examples of these things are. And this, of course, will transition into our discussion of energy uh, for the, the, the very end of the class. Uh, but the idea is, you know, there are things that we can do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to reduce greenhouse gases that are in the um, atmosphere already. And this, of course, is going to lessen the severity of future climate change. OK, but it's already changed, right? And so adaptation is this idea that while we're doing that, uh, we need to be doing things that will lessen the impact or minimize the impact of, um, of climate change on us currently. So it's not all doom and gloom when it comes to uh, politics and climate change. So at, at the national level, uh, our administration is really not very concerned about climate change. In fact, uh, they've uh, pulled the US out of some of these international uh, agreements to try and fight climate change globally. But we're still getting work done on the local level. So from your reading for today, what are some of the things that states have been doing uh, to pursue climate mitigation? Yeah, yeah. So looking at um, the amount of energy that's going to come from renewable sources. Yeah, yeah. So even though there's not uh, a national push at this moment for renewable energy development, many states are saying, OK, if that's not going to happen at the national level, we're going to do it at the state level. And so a lot of states are coming up with plans for the percentage of their energy that they're going to get from renewable sources. Um, so just to look at a couple of these. When we look at um, 
Uh, states, we've got states like California, Colorado, Nevada, Hawaii, New Mexico, Maine, Maryland, Washington State, New York. Those have all passed bills that are transitioning to clean energy, right? So, um, so stuff that's less fossil fuel intensive. And it's, it, it's good to see because in some of these states, it's not just one party that's doing it, right? Like it talked about Maine, for instance, is a state where it's not Democratic majority, but they still realize that transitioning um, to renewable energy is going to be important if we're going uh, to, so to, to um, mitigate climate change. So like in Maine, by 2030, 80% of their electricity is going to come from renewable sources. Like, that's amazing, right? Because we're at like 11% countrywide. That's amazing. Um, Buncombe County as well has come up with a plan uh, to get, I'm trying to think what the numbers are right now, but there's a plan for systematically increasing the amount of energy that government buildings get from renewables. And so there's plans to put solar panels on a lot of the government buildings in Buncombe County. So, um, so even as we might look at like the federal scene and not see a lot of movement on mitigation for climate change, um, we see things moving at the state level and even at, at the local level. So Maryland um, uh, um, Republican governor signed off on legislation that will require 50% of electricity to re be renewable by 2030. And 100% by 2040, right? So this is this is amazing, right? These are really good, really good steps in the right direction. So I just wanted to bring that up uh, to make the point that, um, you know, just because we don't see a lot of movement at the federal level, does not mean that our country is not moving toward renewable energy. So in fact, there is a transition that's happening, and our. Um, we teach a course in this department, which some of y'all may take in the spring. It's called Energy and Society. And Dr. Kevin Moorhead, who retired last year and taught that course for a couple decades, said that, you know, renewable energy, that train has left the station. Like, it, we're on it. Like, the, the world is going to renewable energy. It's just a matter of how quickly we get on that train. <laughs> because we mentioned China gets more of its energy from renewables than the US does. Nepal, where I was, in the Peace Corps and then back in 2015, they get 80% of their energy from renewables, right? So the world is moving toward renewable energy, um, but we just have a lot of inertia in the U.S. because we have a very fossil fuel intensive economy. And the conversation about change is a little uncomfortable here. And also, like, our culture, as you all probably know, we're very individualistic, right? We're very independent, which is awesome in a lot of ways. But when it comes to like collective change and people making changes to their lifestyle, that conversation is harder, right? And it takes more time. So things are moving in that direction. Um, don't get discouraged when you don't see massive movement at the federal level, because things are happening at the state and local levels. But there's an ethical piece to all this. This is an article that, um, that really struck me. So this is a, a, a map of the world, of course. And um, the top map has countries like swollen in proportion to uh, their carbon emissions. And so when you look here, you know, it's not surprising which, uh, which countries are swollen the most. You've got, of course, um, the US, Western Europe, uh, China, whereas regions of the world like many of the African nations, uh, South America, are shrunken way down. In other words, those countries don't produce a whole lot of carbon. Now this bottom panel is a graph based on predicted mortality due to climate change, right? So in other words, if the climate warms at the rate that it has been, um, what increase in mortality are we expected to see in different countries? And Places like Sub-Saharan Africa are expected to get hit pretty hard uh, because that's one of the areas that's, that has been warming pretty rapidly, and so food production is going to decline. So when you see where mortality is expected to increase due to climate change, you see nations in Africa. You see, uh, you see India and Bangladesh, right? You see places like that. Where you don't see a lot of increased mortality predicted 
is where? It's in North America, right? It's in Western Europe. So there's this disconnect, right, between um, countries that are contributing the most to climate change and the countries that are expected to be hit hardest by climate change. And this is why global negotiations about carbon emissions are so hard. Because the countries that really want to see the change happen are not the countries that are producing the most carbon. And so when they sit down at a negotiating table, they're trying to convince countries that aren't expected to get hit super hard by climate change to reduce their emissions. Whereas those countries that are producing all the carbon, if they just look at their own nation, don't necessarily have such a strong incentive. Now, to me personally, you know, we all have our different spiritual and ethical beliefs, right? But to me, I happen to think that it's kind of random that I happen to be born in the US. What if I've been born in Africa or born in South America, whatever, right? So if you think of us all as like one human family all over the globe, then all of a sudden it's like, well, for sure, like, like why should my lifestyle imperil folks in other parts of the world? But, um, but as we also know with politicians, um, it's tough to make hard decisions, right? Because you can become unpopular if uh, you are making the hard decisions about people changing the way that they live and things. So, so this is going to, this climate change, I think more than any other issue, it transcends national boundaries. It questions our whole identity as a human race, not just as like a provincial sort of where are you living right now on the planet. And it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out in the future. This was an article published in uh, the journal uh, The Lancet, which is actually a medical journal. It called climate change the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. So this is not even an environmental journal. This is a medical journal. Um, you know, and so when it was published, the 12 warmest years on record in the last century and a half had come in the last 13 years. And they take it a little bit further and they say, look, the health impacts of climate change will be felt all around the world and not just in some distant future, but in our lifetime and those of our children. And it goes on to say that our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, are going to look back at our generation pretty critically if we don't work towards climate change mitigation. So, so I, there's, there's, there is an ethical um, question that gets connected here, um, here as well. Um, places like Bangladesh are already seeing increased incidences of flooding um, due to rising sea levels. Um, as I mentioned, places like Sub-Saharan Africa are seeing increased incidence of crop failure due to increased drought frequency. So these things are happening, um, but they may not necessarily impact us in Asheville, North Carolina today. So that's why we got to think globally, right? Okay. Um, all right, so just a couple examples of what mitigation could look like. Like, how would we be able to, to start to undo, right, some of these climate change impacts? So just one thing to keep in mind is the role of, like, what we do on the land. So if we realize that increasing CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere are a result, they're a result of carbon moving from where into the atmosphere? Any thoughts? So we've got more CO2 in the atmosphere. It's not coming from space. Where's it been coming from? Coming from underground, right? It's been coming largely from burning fossil fuels. So we'd like to get that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and back under the ground. Well, what kind of things take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere? What kind of living things? Plants, right? Plants. Any trees, any grass. Next time you see like a blade of grass, I was going to say a leaf on a tree, but we're not having so many of those anymore. Those are all carbon dioxide removal machines, right? They're all taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and they're photosynthesizing. So if we'd like to get that carbon back into the soil, one good way to do that is to use plants that take it up quickly and can put it back under the soil. 
Um, so there have been lots of studies on this, but you know, one of them said that if we manage our land differently, a little bit differently, we could offset a third of global carbon emissions. In other words, we could take more and more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, um, and that would offset what we're putting uh, up into the atmosphere. See a couple folks still jotting notes down, so I'll pause for a moment. So when we think about most of the carbon, it, where the, most of the carbon is on land, you know, soil, there's a lot of it in the soil, a lot of it in the soil. So the ecosystems with the highest rate of above ground carbon accumulation, thinking around the world, what ecosystems do you think are storing the most carbon above ground? In other words, taking it out of the air, turning it into plant biomass. Any thoughts? Yes, you're exactly right. Tropical forests. <laughs> so tropical forests are the areas that are taking the most carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turning it into plant biomass. They also produce between 20 and 30 percent of the oxygen anywhere on the planet. Right? So uh, tropical forests are the places where we have the most carbon dioxide getting taken out of the atmosphere and put into, into plant biomass. Right? So those lush tropical jungles, right? all those leaves, all those trunks, all those roots, they're all made out of carbon that have been in the atmosphere. Right? Well, the ecosystem with the highest rates of below ground carbon accumulation so the difference are grasslands. We don't have as many grasslands around as we used to, right? Like out in the Midwestern US, it used to look like this. It used to be these natural grasslands and it was kind of like the African savanna. We had herbivores grazing on them, right? Which were bison and elk and things like that. And then we had carnivores feeding on them. We had, uh, we had mountain lions. Uh, we had jaguars, things like that. These were grassland ecosystems. Well, remember how we talked about the incredible root systems of grasslands when we talked about erosion? So all those roots, if it's a perennial plant, are going to stay underground, right? And so the grass is taking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and there's a lot more biomass below the soil surface than there is above it. So they're taking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, they're storing it in their root biomass underground. And then the part of the grass on top of the land dies off in the winter, but it's going to sprout back again in the spring and it's going to keep taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and going to keep storing it in those roots underground. So these grasslands, it turns out, are really important when we think about taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it someplace where it's going to stay for a while. Of course, what are we doing now with the land that used to be grasslands? What's that? So in some places we're building on it, yeah. And think of like, you know, Illinois, Kansas, Nebraska. Yeah. A lot of crops, a lot of crops. So the sports teams out there are like the Nebraska Cornhuskers instead of like the Nebraska tall grass or something. I don't know. Yeah, we're growing, we're growing crops out there. Well, maybe there's some stuff we could grow that would still get carbon underground. Well, oh, say just another picture again, like y'all have seen, right? All the root mass below ground. So when we convert row crop agriculture to grazed grasslands, it's interesting to see what happens to carbon storage. So just to orient you to this graph, uh, this is agricultural land, row crop agriculture, that was converted uh, to, a, to a natural grassland. And so you can see it took a couple years, but all of a sudden the amount of carbon that was stored quadrupled. 
So if we use our land more efficiently, and uh, we can turn some of it back to natural grasslands, we can store four times as much carbon in those soils as is currently there now. So grasslands are going to help us take a lot of, of carbon out. <laughs> but we can even accelerate things. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a radish. And um, it is really, so it's, um, it's what's called a tillage radish. So you, you plant these things to make the soil fertile. And instead of harvesting them and growing them, you normally like plow them under, right? So these radishes grow and like they concentrate nutrients and things and they take carbon dioxide uh, out of there. So just a couple of stats, you don't have to write all these down, but um, so this is, uh, these are some farms out in Kansas and Nebraska where they've planted these. And about 12,000 acres in one year took out almost 7,000 tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. So that's the same amount that's stored in 7,000 acres of forest, but forests take decades and decades to grow, right? Planting these radishes, it sucked all that out in one year. Similarly, that's the emissions of 1,300 cars. So I just bring this up to say that there are methods that we can use um, to get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and to start undoing some of the things that we've done. Now, it's going to take, of course, uh, collective will to do this. But as we've seen with the article on what states and local communities are doing, there are a lot of folks that are working to try and undo effects of, of climate change. So um, these cover crops, what they do, right, is they take the CO2 out of the atmosphere, store it underground in this big root, essentially. Just a couple of stats. Um, One of the questions that you might ask is, um, you know, so this is a study looking at the amount of, of forest that could be done. So, um, so an increase in one billion hectares of forest could reduce the amount of warming we experience. But the question is where to put all that, right? Because we need so much land for ag and so much land for our cities. Well, we have a lot of land that's degraded already. So if you remember the beginning of class, all those, um, um, the mountaintop removal mining lands that we talked about. So there's a project going on called the Appalachian Regional Reforestation Initiative. That's land that we're not doing anything with. It's just sitting out there. There have been over 100 million trees planted on those areas since 2004. So there's actually someone at the University of Kentucky who's doing research now on how to plant trees in that, in that area. Because the soil is not very good, right? I mean, it's been, it's been mined and it's had stuff. Um, the layers of soil have been, have been all messed with. But it's been doing research to plant trees. And so if we can find degraded land to plant on, uh, there's a lot of potential. And so forests where we are have been identified as a place where we can plant a lot more trees uh, because the land has been messed up by mining, uh, but we're learning now to plant, how to plant trees there. And this uh, Appalachian Regional For Reforestation Initiative um, has really played a role on that. <clears throat> okay. So... As I mentioned, like most places in the world um, are a little bit more concerned about climate change than the US. And Nepal is one of those places. Now, with us in the States, like if you want vegetables, you go to, I don't know, go to Ingalls, you go to, I don't know, wherever you go to buy stuff. But if you're living in a village in Nepal and you want vegetables, you've got to grow it yourself. And so often what you find is that folks that are living in, with a very close connection to the land, uh, they're aware of when things are starting to change, right? So uh, like 
when you plant, right? Like, when does the rainfall come? When does the temperature warm? Those kinds of things. So it's just interesting, like, um, to think about people that live in close association with the land. And so this study, uh, these researchers asked villagers, like, they didn't say, like, do you think climate change is happening or whatever? They just said, like, have you noticed any changes in what the climate has been doing recently? Like, like have you noticed any changes in, like, when you plant your crops, when you harvest your crops, in the growing season, any of that kind of stuff? And what was really interesting about that, uh, this is, this is uh, the study right here, was that without being asked, the villagers already said, the climate is warming, right? Which is, in fact, what the meteorological data said. It said per, they said precipitation patterns are changing. It's not raining at the same times it used to. It's raining in different amounts than it used to. And they said water sources are drying up. So springs that you know, our ancestors used to get water from for hundreds of years are now drying up. These, are, these changes are, are happening. And those were, um, this was confirmed with meteorological data. There was also this perception of change in phenology. Does anyone know what that term means? So phonology are, uh, sorry, phonology is the timing of life cycle events of plants and animals. So for instance, when species migrate, when plants flower, when plants go to seed, those are all referred to as, as phenology. So there was this perception that migratory birds were arriving earlier, uh, plants were flowering at different times, all these different kinds of things, and that it was most sensitive at higher elevations. So all of these trends uh, were backed up by, by scientific data. And so it just shows that like, in the US, like, we're not really closely tied to the environment, right? We don't you know, have to look at the climate when we like, plant our crops and everything and, and, and get our, um, well, some of us do, but the majority of us aren't farmers, and so we don't have to pay attention to these kinds of uh, temperature and weather events. But people that do have been noticing changes. So there has been this warming increase in Nepal. Um, there's been uh, changes in the precipitation patterns and uh, changes in the start and the length of the growing season as well. So, um, so these are all kind of um, confirmed by that. All right. Any questions about any of this so far? So what I wanted to do next was chat just a little bit about what we're seeing in responses um, by plants and animals to the changing climate. So there was an article published back in 2003 in which the authors claimed that at that time there was a coherent fingerprint of climate change across natural systems. Right? So this is like 17 years ago. And so these authors, uh, Camille Parmesan at University of Texas, basically said, look, we can look at what plants and animals are doing now, and we can see that there's been a change. Right? And it connects with what we've been seeing with change to the climate. And one of the things that they looked at was uh, the range of species. Do you know what we mean by the range of a species? The, the, you know, the, the proportion of the Earth, the, the part of the Earth's surface where they, where the, that they occupy. So these authors looked at butterflies um, in Great Britain. And they sort of lucked out, because in Great Britain, they have a tradition of uh, citizen scientists, people who like to go out and collect data on the environment and on plants and animals. So over hundreds of years, people have collected data on butterflies, essentially saying what butterfly species they found, 
in which areas. So these authors looked at the, this historical set of data, and they looked at 35 non-migratory butterfly species. Why do you think they picked non-migratory butterfly species? Why is the non-migratory part important? Yeah, good, they'll be more confined. They you wouldn't expect them to be moving around, right? If you've got a migratory species, it's going to be moving around a lot anyway. But if they're non-migratory, shouldn't be moving around much. Okay. So they looked at how many of those species shifted their range to the north, and how many of those shifted their range to the south through the 20th century. And what they found was that 63% of those species shifted their ranges to the north, whereas only 3% shifted their range to the south. Now, nature is not static, right? It, it doesn't remain immobile. So you would expect that there would be some change over 100 years. But if that change is not affected by warming temperatures, what would you expect about the percentage of species shifting to the north and the percentage shifting to the south? If it's just kind of random variation and some species are going either way. We should do this study. We should go outside. I, I'm bummed that this class doesn't get us outside, unfortunately. And that sometimes I, th I take a little field trip down to the, the creek with this class, but in the current climate, shall we say, that's a little hard to do. I'm kind of bummed that we do this whole class inside, but if we were to do this study, if we were to go out and, and look at, you know, which butterflies we find where, you know, I would probably expect that if there's been no significant environmental change, we've had this, we, we would have the same percentage of species shifting to the north and the same percentage shift into the south, right? If it's just kind of random variation. But in fact, a lot more were shifting to the north. Why might they be shifting to the north? It's cooler, right? We're in the northern hemisphere, right? So as you move to the north, so we're north of the equator. So as you move to the north, you're moving to cooler climates. Now, if we were in the southern hemisphere, Moving to the south would move you toward the pole, pole and you would find cooler temperatures. But uh, yeah, so this suggests that something, in fact, is causing these species to migrate to the north, to move to the north. They're not migrating, they're shifting their whole range. So here in Western North Carolina, it's interesting to think about this because um, I think, as I've mentioned before, about 15,000 years ago, we had these sheets of ice that, that covered much of 15,000 years ago. This black line um, is the margin of the most recent glacial maximum. And then there was another time when ice sheets came all the way down to here. So these ice sheets never came down all the way to North Carolina. But when these ice sheets were here, of course, the temperature was a lot colder. It was a lot colder. Well, then, starting 15,000 years ago and moving uh, to the present, these ice sheets kind of migrated north as they melted. Now, what was it? Do you all remember? What was it that caused the Earth's temperature to change between these glacial and interglacial periods? Do you remember what was driving that change? Yeah, good. So those are all things that affected the climate. And the one factor that leads to the alternation between um, ice ages and interglacial periods is the Earth's orbit around the sun and how that varies, so those Milankovitch cycles. So these cycles um, determine how close the Earth's orbit comes to the sun. And that's why we go through glacial periods when the orbit is shaped such that we're further from the sun and interglacial periods when, there's, when the, the Earth's climate is warmer, 
when those uh, orbits are such that we're on average closer to the sun. So this is the Earth's orbit that causes these ice sheets uh, to advance and retreat. So anyway, as these ice sheets were moving north from 15,000 years ago to the present, what happened was that we had several species that moved north with them, right? So cold temperature species, as the Earth's climate warmed after the last ice age, they moved to the north. But there's another way you can find cooler temperatures too, besides moving to the north. What can you do? You can go up to high elevation. And so we have several species in the Appalachians that uh, settled in the high elevation uh, spots of the Appalachian Mountains. They had been migrating north because of these retreating glaciers, but then they found temperatures that were cool enough at these high elevation in the Appalachians. We call these glacial relict populations because they're species that used to occur all across this area, but now they're restricted to high elevation areas because the climate is warmed, and so there are only some spots that are cool enough for them. And a couple examples of that are the northern flying squirrel. This is a picture, this is a map of the northern flying squirrel's range. And so you can see it occurs here in the southern Appalachians uh, as well, up in Appalachians in West Virginia. But then it's up in New England, right, where it's a lot colder. And then it's in a couple other high elevation spots here and there. Uh, we have real high diversity of salamander species here. And several of them actually need cool temperatures. So that's why we find them at higher elevation spots. We also have the smallest member of the tarantula family. Isn't it cute? The spruce fir moth spider. It's tiny. It's like a half inch. It's tiny. Similarly, it also needs cold climates. So it's out there on like Grandfather Mountain and stuff like that. So all these species exist here in Western North Carolina, but then they don't exist any place nearby because when you go from their areas, you go down in elevation and it gets warmer. All right, but as the temperature continues to warm, how might it affect these species? Any thoughts? Yeah, so they'll try to go up in elevation if they can. <laughs> but whereas these individuals can keep moving north, these individuals, they can't go north, right? Because down here, there's a, it's, it gets warmer. When you go north here, it gets warmer as you go down in elevation. Um, so the question is, how are they going to be affected by warming? The other thing is, how is it different now for species to migrate than it was like 15,000 years ago? How does the landscape look different? It's had a lot of development, right? So we look, you know, we look down on the earth now, we see a lot of this. It's called habitat fragmentation. So we see some intact patches of forest, but then we see lots of areas of agricultural land use. And so if you imagine that you're a species that needs forest and you're in this little patch here, and you gotta migrate over here, and you gotta stick to forest because that's your habitat, it's, it's kind of tricky, right? There are huge, huge areas of land that you can't use because it doesn't have the habitat anymore. And, oh, by the way, we've got all these roads, which are certainly hazardous for a lot of wildlife species to cross. So the ability of species to migrate now in response to a warming climate is going to be different than it was 15,000 years ago uh, because of this sort of like patchwork quilt of different land cover types. And if the land cover type that a certain species needs is not continuous, then it's going to be challenging for them uh, to get where they need to go. OK. So that's one thing that we've seen, is a shift of these species uh, to the north or to higher elevation in response to warming temperatures. <clears throat> 
The other thing that has been noticed is uh, changes in phenology. And so again, phenology, these are periodic plant and animal cyc uh, cyclic events. So like events in their, in their life cycles. So these authors looked at some data, um, and our x-axis is a year, and you can see they go, f these ones go from about 1930 to the year 2000. And they looked at a bunch of different events that happened in the ecosystem. They looked at when some uh, bird species arrived. So these are migratory bird species. When did they arrive, right? Because birds migrate largely based on on, on temperature cues, some of them, not all of them. Then they also looked at when uh, certain flower species bloomed. And it's interesting, they found some species that were responding to this environmental change, and then some that didn't. So there were responders and non-responders. But there's like a negative slope to this line here. Oh, I'm sorry. I should tell you. The y-axis here is Julian calendar day. What's Julian calendar day? Anybody ever heard of that term? Anybody ever see the movie Madagascar? You're familiar with King Julian? He's the one who did it. No, he's not. But it'd be really fun if he was the one who did it. Um, yeah. He says, happy Julianuary is what he says. That's his favorite month. Julian calendar day is just like day one is January 1st, and day 365 is December 31st. And so it's just like the number of days into the year, if that makes sense. So um, yeah, so anyway, so Julian calendar day from lowest to highest. So like Julian day 120, that's like, four times 30, so that's like four months into the year. These responders, there's like a negative slope here. And what that means is that by the end of the 20th century, these flowers are blooming earlier in the year than they had before. These bird species were arriving earlier in the year than they had before. But then, interestingly enough, some species were not responding. So this is an interesting thing to look at. But uh, there has been change in phenology for some things, at least, some species. Uh, this is an interesting experiment done out in Oklahoma, speaking of uh, grasslands and stuff. Um, it's really beautiful, isn't it? Like, these, these grasslands, like, nowadays you think of Oklahoma, we think of, like, 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 cattle grazing, primarily is what they do out there, but these natural grasslands are quite beautiful. So these researchers out there, um, they warmed sections of the tall grass prairie, and then they looked at when the, um, when the plants flowered, if that makes sense. This is their experimental setup. So they had these heaters that were placed above plots of uh, grassland, and then they had some that were turned on and some that were not, so that they had a control for the one that was heated. And this is what the data looked like. So Julian Day, from day 60, which is like the end of February, to day 330, which is like the end of November. And then each of these is a, uh, a genus name, the name of a genus of flower. And then the, the green bar is when that species flowered. And the diamond is, I think it's a median, sorry. Uh, the median, like when the flowering was most intense. And then this vertical line here is the warmest day of the year. So what, what was happening here? Any ideas what might be happening here? Any, any thoughts? <laughs> 
what was, if you compare the, the diamonds in the red and the green on this side, on the left side, what do you notice happening here? Good, there's a shift to the left, uh-huh. So when it was warmed, these flowers were, were all flowering a little bit earlier in the year. But what about when you look at the ones on the right? Comparing the diamonds in the warming and the control, what do we see? Do you see the same trend or a different trend? Good. Mm -hmm. They're blooming later. So what they saw was that as the temperature is warming, or as it's getting warm, like as temperature is increasing through spring into summer, then when it was even warmer, those, those flowers flowered earlier because they're waiting to hit a certain key temperature before they flower. But then as temperatures were cooling, those that, that were under um, a warming regime flowered later. So what's interesting was there's kind of this gap in the middle, like flowers that would normally, you know, flower close to the hottest time of the year were flowering earlier if they were in the, ex in the increasing part of the graph. Whereas flowers in the decreasing part of the graph, they were flowering later because it took longer for that decreasing temperature to hit the temperature that they, they needed to flower. So there's like this time in the middle when there, weren't, when there wasn't anything flowering under the warming conditions. It increased the time in the middle when it was too hot for anything to be flowering. Why might that be a problem for the ecosystem if we have a time in the hottest part of the year when there aren't any flowers flowering? Any thoughts? What do, what do plants need to be able to reproduce if they're making flowers? Pollen, yeah, pollen and pollinators, yeah. So the concern is those insects, which would normally, not only do the flowers rely on the insects, the insects rely on the flowers to give them nectar to feed on, right? So the concern is this hottest time of the year, there may not be flowers out there for these insects to feed on. Conversely, that, that, you know, you might not have those insects around later on, potentially, if they're not able to make it through that time period. So, um, so anyway, um, yeah, as I said, what happened is that flowers that flower before the peak flowered earlier in the year. Flowers that flowered after the peak flowered later in the year. So there was kind of this, this disconnect, which you might expect, right? Because it's a temperature that's never really occurred before. All right, so keep this in mind then, right? The two observed effects of climate change on species that we've seen is first of all, this expansion toward the poles or to higher elevation. And the second piece is this uh, change in phenology. And phenology, again, uh, are, it refers to the timing of cyclical events in the life, lives of plants and animals.